Welcome, and thank you for coming out this afternoon. I'm Cindy Powell with the Arinda Association. Today, we're going to focus on prevention, preparedness, and evacuation. We have Dave Winokur, our fire chief with Moraga Arinda Fire District. We have Duncan Seibert, who is the chair of the Lafayette Emergency Preparedness Commission. He put this document together. Mark Nagel, police chief, Arinda Police Department, and in the audience we have Dennis Rain, Emergency Preparedness Coordinator for the Moraga Rinda Fire District. To orient you to the problem, these are the very high fire hazard severity zones as CAL FIRE has designated them. The reason I put this slide up is to show that one, there are significant areas of red in North Arinda and in the La Marinda area. And two, that the threat we are primarily concerned about for a catastrophic regional wildfire is emanating out of the wilderness lands in the Briones watershed to our north, and it will be carried by a Diablo wind in the fall by a north or a northeast wind. Ambient temperatures are not a critical element to fire spread. Low humidities and high winds are. And those events have always occurred in California in the fall. But the difference now, and, and the primary driver of the change of fire behavior over the last several years that we have seen, is that with the onset of climate change, those Diablo winds are now preceding the onset of the rainy season. So the conditions that have created historically bad fires on a periodic basis are now a recurring annual event, which means our exposure to the potential for one of these large-scale fires is here and is here to stay. John Radke and his team at the Center for Catastrophic Risk Management John is also an Orinda resident, have been modeling this problem for years. So we've been able to harness that and identify what would happen on 30 mile an hour winds with low fuel moistures. If they model a fire start right here where that star is, which is at Bear Creek Road and Happy Valley, right on the eastern end of the Briones Reservoir. And what you see with the colored outlines here are modeled one hour spreads. And so what that model shows is in about four hours, most of Sleepy Hollow and the Downs will be consumed by fire and the primary evacuation route from the downs will be impacted by direct flame impingement and will therefore be closed to traffic. So th that's a pretty scary scenario, especially given the speed at which that fire is modeled to spread. The next thing they did, they made recommendations for fuels mitigation work within 30 feet of the shoulder on both sides of Bear Creek Road, making specific mitigations. Take out this brush, trim this tree to this height, masticate this understory, and then they ran the model again. With all other conditions being equal, the machine says the fire will not jump the road. And what that means then is what we took what could have been a catastrophic fire running through about a thousand homes in North Orinda and the Downs and Sleepy Hollow. Instead, this becomes an interesting column of smoke and the loss of some grass rangeland that will regrow with the onset of the next rains. This is a fire that we will be able to aggregate the effective firefighting response force to put out and we'll suppress this without any loss of property or loss of life. This is the goal we are driving towards, and this is the work we are doing with the North Orinda Shaded Fuel Break to create essentially a interruption in the continuity of fuel along the northern edge of the district from Akalani's High up to Inspiration Point along approximately 14 miles. That will buy us time to prevent a fire from spreading into the populated areas that we are concerned about. This work that we're doing in the exterior, around the perimeter of the community, that only addresses the ground component of fire. The fire that moves from tree to tree, from brush to brush, from blade of grass to blade of grass, in a linear manner along the ground. The fire also spreads through three-dimensional ember cast, or blown firebrands, or flaming objects, that can be blown miles in advance of the main body of the fire. And when those embers come to ground, if they land on a receptive fuel bed, on a pile of leaves, on a lot with dead grass that has not been treated, in a gutter that is full of some form of dry matter, they then create a fire in its own right, which can grow to be just as damaging as the main fire. So now we pivot to what you can do. The appropriate response to the three-dimensional spread of fire is that every parcel owner, every resident, does defensible space work both to remove fuels immediately adjacent to your house, which will help against the ground component, but also along your entire property. So the entire parcel has been cleared so that if an ember lands, 
it is less likely to start another fire. Lots of people have told me as I've given this talk throughout the community that I don't see how doing one house is going to make a difference. But when that person does the work and their neighbors do the work and their neighbors' neighbors and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and we get up to 5, 10, 15, 20, 100 homes in an area have completed their work, we have now created a fuel break inside the district that will stop or slow the spread of fire, will buy time for responding units to get there, it will buy time for evacuations to be executed, and for any residents who are either unable or unwilling to evacuate, it will increase the survivability profile of their shelter in place option of remaining in their home. The best way to do that is pursuing Firewise Community Designation. The program of record for capturing the work done by residents to reduce fuels and reduce their fire risk. It is a great way to harness a group of neighbors to focus on the problem. It is an element you can include in the conversation with your insurance company about either the rate or the insurability of your home. And the district is eager to partner with neighborhoods that are interested in pursuing that. We have several that are getting very close to certification and we look forward to encouraging others. What should be done on every parcel is grass should be cut to less than three inches. Uh, brush should be thinned or removed. An isolated stand of brush is fine. A field of brush is not. But what we want to do is break up the horizontal and vertical continuity of fuels so that fire isn't able to jump from object to object to object, gaining speed and intensity as it runs. Trees need to be trimmed and limbed six to eight feet from the ground. And what we're doing there is we're creating an air gap. We're creating space so that a fire on the ground in the grass, a low intensity, relatively slow moving fire, does not have a path through which it can climb into the canopy where there's much greater availability of fuels. The only trees that are required to be removed or eliminated are dead or dying trees. Healthy trees upon which the canopy work has been done to limb them up and ladder fuels have been reduced underneath are a very, very low risk. Our friends over at FireSafe Marin came with a really good list of plants uh, they don't like. We spent a long time, uh, 15 years or so, worried about drought and planting drought resistant plants. Well, most of the qualities that make a plant drought resistant also make them very dangerous from a fire standpoint. But you shouldn't have them right next to the house. And they shouldn't be in a continuous bed that would allow fire to move from point to point. We also would like to see roadside clearance. A lot of our roads and streets are very narrow. Remember during any evacuation scenario, as we are trying to get all of you out, we are also trying to move very large fire engines in. And the degree to which those roads are impinged by vegetation on the shoulder, we lose that effective width of the road. We also are concerned about encroaching vegetation setting up fire to jump that road. The degree to which vegetation is encroaching on both sides, that will reduce the effectiveness of that road to stop spread, especially interlocking canopy, overgrown brush. Think of anything that could cause fire to spread into your home. Take a lap around your house, right next to the perimeter, looking at the foundation. If there are accumulations of dead grass, dry leaves, dead or decadent plants, those sort of things right next to your house, you are, you're creating the conditions for a fire to start right next to your house. The next step would be do that same lap, but looking up this time, look at the eaves. Is there a trellis delivering decadent vines directly against the house? Are there branches and leaves encroaching under the home right up against the eave? And are there collections of dead material, specifically pine needles and leaves, in the valleys of your roof and in your gutters. Because if you have those on your roof, you're creating a receptive fuel bed, and potentially a spot fire, on your house itself. The ordinance requires within 100 feet of the home that all consumable or combustible vegetation has been maintained in accordance with those standards. We are doing outreach and education and we're going to be issuing citations for people who are non-compliant. This is not something we've done a lot of in the past. We're focusing our priority of effort along the evacuation routes to make sure those roadsides are clear and those parcels have been cleared back. The city is not responsible for roadside vegetation maintenance as an easement and the property owner is responsible for maintaining that vegetation. In the fire district, there's 14,000 parcels. We will never have the resources to do gardening and landscaping and maintenance work on 14,000 parcels. And we need to mobilize the community's ability to do work on their own parcels to start there and reduce the threat of a fire spreading from your land onto your neighbors. If a fire occurs and you have done your defensible space work, that's going to slow the fire. That's good. However, we still have the potential that a fire is going to exceed our efforts and will require evacuation. If you sign up for the community warning system, the CWS, you will receive our notifications. 
When you sign up for the CWS, you link your cell phone number, your email address, and the ability to text to your address. And that means when the CWS goes to make notifications, you will get notification via four avenues. And one of those is likely to get through if we have four ways to get a hold of you. If we have not been able to contact you to tell you you need to evacuate, we are trading space for time to get everyone out and your clock hasn't started yet because you don't know there's a problem. Signing up for the CWS is the best way to be notified. It's the primary mechanism we're going to use. In this county, we're very fortunate to have a best in class, everyone else wants it system. Nixle alerts are an interesting way to get non-emergent information, things about road closures and so forth. But the actual notifications will made, be made via CWS. If you're signed up for Nixle, I would strongly encourage you to also sign up for CWS. However, a weather alert radio, which is a very inexpensive item with a battery backup, has a 120 decibel siren. So basically you have a siren in your house that the CWS is able to activate uh, if you're concerned about additional notification. And the last one I think is the most important, and that's purchasing an uninterrupted power supply, or a UPS. And it doesn't need to be a very big one. This is about a $100 item. And what that will do if you have a cordless phone, that will keep the base station powered. If your phone doesn't work, you can't receive the call telling it's time to go. The second thing that will do is power the router modem that keeps your Wi-Fi up. Then your smartphone still is able to communicate with the outside world. And you are still able to find out what's happening, get a notification, check traffic conditions, get alerts about what roads are open or closed, all of those sorts of things that will inform your decision of how to evacuate and when to evacuate. The third bullet there I think is critical and that's developing a neighborhood notification plan. If you are notified, we would ask that you and your neighbors have thought about a bottom-up, resilient, organize your own neighborhood manner, how you're going to tell your neighbors there's a problem. What we're hoping is that a single positive notification to a, a member of the community acts as a pebble dropped into a pond. And that ripple will spread through the pond as neighbors notify neighbors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The second component of that, if you have neighbors who need help getting down the stairs or neighbors who do not drive, we are not going to be able to respond units to get there in a rapid manner. Calls for service, for a lift assist, for help down the stairs, those are going to be received and processed. But the folks who are actually going to carry that out are going to be coming from out of the area. So if neighbors are able to help evacuate neighbors, you, you have already pre-positioned, if you will, the evacuation resource inside the community. Comma, if you have multiple cars, please only take one though. Right? Because if you have three cars, you just tripled your impact on the evacuation network. So we ask you to take one, but if you have an empty seat and you have a neighbor who, needs, who is either unable or unwilling to drive on their own, please notify them and give them a ride out. All this information we have, all these pieces and parts we have, have to be integrated into a single platform. And what this is linked to is a ground-based sensor, and we, we have fielded ground-based sensors for early fire detection and warning now, which says, hey, I see a fire. Then we use near real-time modeling to predict where that fire is going to go in the next one, three, and five hours. And we drop those in to prioritized evacuation recommendations based on the polygons. This is a useful way for us to subdivide the community so we can make prioritized time-phased evacuations. There is almost no scenario where we want to make a broadcast to the entire community essentially saying run for it. Knowing that we are moving you from a home which is inherently fire resistant into a car that is inherently combustible in a traffic jam of epic magnitude. And what that does is that forms a common operating picture. So the firefighters who are up on the hill can communicate to the police officers who are going to order the evacuation, who can communicate to the CWS folks who are actually going to issue the evacuation orders. So these are the, the foot stompers, the things I hope you take away from this. Please do your fuels mitigation work. Sign up for the CWS system. That is the way we're going to get a hold of you. Develop a neighborhood notification plan so if you get notified, your neighbors will know what you know and vice versa. And then if you would like additional layers of security, please consider purchasing a weather alert radio and an uninterrupted power supply to ensure you have the ability to communicate and to receive information from the outside world. I want to talk about, again, community alerts. If this is what we use to tell you to go, you need to sign up for it. So how are we doing? So we've been at this for probably a year or more, stressing the importance of getting notification out. Here's where we stand. Miranda's 25% of the population, Moraga's 22.5, and Lafayette is 17. Another way to look at this is 75% are not. We also use Nixle for text. There's 9,347 and 3,669 emails for Orinda, 
signed up on Nixel. Anyone you know the population of Orinda? All round up, it's about 20,000. So we got some work to do, and we will keep at it. I'm the chair of the Lafayette Emergency Preparedness Commission. As a commission, it was our instruction from the city council to put out a document to help people getting prepared for an emergency. We put together this document and it became the La Mirinda Guide. The primary pages of this that I think are critically important for, for all of us are the evacuation tip pages with do now, go back, do now documents, do now preparedness actions. Do them now because you have lots of time now. You won't have lots of time when there's a fire. The first do now was go bags, getting bags ready so you have your essentials. Well, for animals, you have to do the same thing. Your animals need their essentials, any medications, a little bit of food, so forth. Access and functional needs people. That's in do now neighborhood. And don't, don't wait for this. Know the preparedness of all of your neighbors and their, their abilities to help during an evacuation. Do now communications. Determine an out-of-state contact. You make a call out of the area to your out-of-state contact, and all of your friends and family who are out of the area can also call that person and find out how you're doing. But you don't actually call. You text. Texting uses little bits of data. Calling uses a lot of bandwidth. The other advantage of text is it's a process called store and forward. It will store it until it can forward it. So it's a much more efficient way of getting the word out. When the fire is near, don't leave your car in the driveway or at the garage if there are fires near or if it's red flag warning. Get your car out. If you have a gate, open the gate, leave it open. Park your car in your driveway, aimed out to the street. You don't want to be backing out into a line of traffic and make sure you have a lot of gas, three quarters of a tank of gas. How do you leave your house? Do you leave the lights on for the first responders? Yes. Do you close and lock all the doors? Yes. Just go through this. It'll tell you how to leave everything for your safety, for the first responders, safety and access. Once you get out or if you are out of town during the evacuation, go to this website, Safe and Well. Tell them that you're okay because other people will check. That's a Red Cross website. If you record someone as missing to the sheriff's office and then you find them, call the sheriff's department back and say you found them. They're no longer missing so they won't spend the resources looking for them anymore. If, worst case, your house is burned down and you've lost everything, by having copies of all of these documents, it makes your life a lot easier. Gather all the documents that affect you, grab your cell phone and take pictures of them, and then save them into the cloud, save them in a couple of places. Then when you go to the local assistance center, you can just sit down and say, here's my thumb drive or here's my cell phone. Here are all of my documents. Your insurance company and the agent and the phone numbers and your policy numbers, your passport, your social security, your military DD-214, your dentist, your primary care doctor. Who are they and what's their phone number? And then put your prescriptions down at the bottom. You'll never get back to where you were before a fire, but you can get back to a, a lifestyle that is good but go through and, and prepare your home. And then think about insurance. What insurance do you have? Do you have enough insurance? And what will your insurance cover? For the insurance, take it, your cell phone and walk through your house and just photograph everything. Just do a video and talk into it and describe it. That's how you prove you had it, so your insurance will cover it. If you live in Moraga or Orinda, you are not evacuated until you're on Highway 24 and you're going east or west. There is nowhere inside the city or the town 
that we are going to have people evacuate too, because we are going to need every square inch of available parking lot open space to stage firefighting resources for the response to try to put this thing out. Anyone who has ever gotten on 24 on a weekday morning, I, I think can vouch to that's where the problem is. The problem is in the village trying to get on those on-ramps to get through the Clover League. If you are heart set on making sure you're going east or west and you're in the wrong lane, when you start trying to merge and change lanes, you're going to back up the flow of traffic, which is going to have a ripple effect on people who are not yet evacuated. So if you're in the right lane on southbound Camino Pablo, that means you're going west on 24. And if you're in the left lane on Camino Pablo, that means you're going east on 24. It's the steady flow of traffic through those choke points that is going to be the critical element in our success to executing a rapid evacuation of the community. Know your neighborhood. Know Route 1, Route 2, Route 3, how to get around and what road leads to what road to get out of town. Red Cross has shelters designated uh, in La Miranda and in other areas. There are lots of factors that go into which shelters will be opened so they don't pre-announce where shelters are. That will be included in the CWS notification that you get. We used the CWS during the evacuation exercises in Moraga in December and in Arinda in January. We will continue to work that process and refine it. Um, the system works. It's exercised on a regular basis in association with the refinery alerts. The pathway essentially is the same system that was used for the presidential alert that was sounded last October when every phone in the country went off. So we're very confident that the, the pipe will work, but what we need is to have the receptors on the end of the pipe, and that involves everyone signing up for the system. June 15th is the requirement that uh, all work has to be completed by that date. Any parcels that are not complete by that date, uh, you're welcome to submit a complaint to the district. We're largely complaint driven when it comes to responding on things other than the primary evacuation routes and the perimeter of the community, uh, and that can be done via our website fmaid at mofd.org or by calling the office. I encourage the email. It's much easier to, to track the complaint when they come in that way. When we receive a complaint, we check both parcels. We received a number of complaints where we've been pulled into a neighborhood dispute, and when we check both parcels, that usually resolves the issue. Thank you to Mark Nagel and Duncan Seibert and to Dave Winokur for taking time out today.